I know you're visiting. Let's stand together. We got a lot of guests here today. Let's welcome those that have come to worship with us. Amen. Amen. Now I want you to turn around and shake somebody's hand and introduce yourself. Tell them you're glad to see them. Amen. Let's take just a moment and welcome one another to the house of the Lord. Let's take a moment and make a new friend. It's such a great honor to have all of our guests here today, and we welcome you to the house of the Lord. Amen. I'm thankful for the name of Jesus and the power that's in the name of the Lord. Amen. And when we're gathered together and He is in our midst, there's no telling what will happen when we believe He is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. Amen. We serve a mighty God. He is good. Somebody say amen. I want to make a few announcements as our choir gets ready to sing. We're going to worship the Lord with them. As they get ready to come, let me mention to you, I thank God for all of our, uh, those that participate, those that are here, those that are teaching in our Sunday school, not only in our younger classes, our student classes, uh, even in our adult classes, we have some great, great men and women of God that share from the word of the Lord every Sunday. And I'm excited about that. Today was no different, uh, but the winter quarter is about to begin. If you would like uh, the workbook that goes along with the lessons, they're available for purchase. Please see Sister Teresa Rainey if you'd like to uh, have that uh, workbook that uh, goes along with what's happening on Sundays. Amen. We have come to worship the Lord. Awesome. Amen. I have, and I know you have. Somebody say amen. Amen. Acts chapter 4 and verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, You rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel, but that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you hold. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Amen. I want to tell you it's the same message 2,000 plus years later. That salvation is in the name of Jesus Christ. And there is power in the name of the crucified Lamb of God. And His name is Jesus. And when we call on that name, there's power in that name. There's identity in that name. There is healing in that name. There is deliverance in that name. When we call on that name, His presence is there in our midst. And we are here to magnify the name of the Lord. So let's do that together this morning. Let's enter His gates with thanksgiving. Let's open this service with praise today. And let's ask the Lord to have His way. Would you join me right now? Jesus, we thank You, Lord, for Your power, for Your Spirit. Lord, for the anointing of the Spirit that we feel here right now. Lord, I pray every part of this service. Lord, we want you to have your way. Lord, when the people of God reach out in faith, Lord, we believe something miraculous can happen. Lord, we believe, Lord, that at any moment someone can be healed. That at any moment, Lord, in this service, someone can be delivered. At any moment in this service, Lord, someone, Lord, can turn their heart to you in repentance and receive the Holy Ghost today. Lord, I believe you today. I thank you for salvation, Lord. I thank you for your word today, Jesus. Now, Lord, anoint this service and loose us to worship you today. Lord, we know, God, we don't have tomorrow and yesterday is over. But we have right now, Lord, 
to worship you and lift you up. And we give you the praise. Let's give the Lord a good hand clap today. Amen. He is worthy. Praise the Lord. He is worthy. Thank you, Jesus. Turn to your neighbor and tell him I'm here to worship the Lord. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. Worship for the choir as they sing.
doubt about it today. We are here celebrating Jesus Christ. He will be the focus of this service. He will be the one to whom we turn our eyes to. He will be the one we put our hope in. He will be the one we place our trust in. Make no mistake about it, his name is Jesus. And some will trust in other things, but we will trust in the name of the Lord. Some will trust in Washington, D.C., but we will trust in the Lord. trusting in his word today we want to go to the Lord in prayer in this kind of atmosphere I believe the Lord can heal how many know the Lord's a healer amen he is a healer we're going to invite those that are in this service that need healing today whatever pain you're battling whatever thing you've asked the Lord to, to heal in your body this is a moment where we can express our faith as we heard today and I appreciate what we heard. You know, there are times where we pray and we think, well, the Lord knows what I ask the first time I ask it, so I'm just not going to ask anymore. But asking is a demonstration of my faith through obedience. And you do realize obedience is better than the sacrifice. The Lord wants us to obey. And he said, if you ask, if you seek, if you knock, so this is another moment I can express my faith through obedience by asking God to move. Amen. That loved one may still be lost, but I'm going to ask God to move again. That pain may still be there, but I'm going to ask God to move again. I'm going to ask him to heal. Somebody say amen. So as we pray, if you're battling sickness or pain today, uh, the doctor hasn't given you the best of reports. We believe the Lord is the great physician, and by his stripes we are healed. Amen. I want to pray for Sister Marna Kenningstein today. She needs healing. Judy Inman has cancer, needs healing today. Also, there are a number of needs that we are still praying for that may be on the screen behind me. And as we pray, I'm inviting the ministry staff to come. And those that want uh, us to anoint you today, we invite you to come as we pray. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for this day, Lord, for the celebration of who you are. Lord, for what we know and experience and what we can believe the word that we can stand upon today. Lord, I'm asking you to touch, uh, touch Tom Bur Barrel today, God. Lord, I know you're able. Lord, go to that hospital where he's at. Minister to Tom today in the name of Jesus. Move, Lord, by your stripes, oh Lord, we're healed. And I believe you this morning to go to St. Louis University Hospital and touch Tom in Jesus' name. Lord, we speak help to that liver right now in the name that's above every name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Lord, I'm believing you today. Oh, I'm trusting you this morning, Lord. We put our faith in you, Lord. We come again. We come again asking, Lord. We come again believing, God, knowing that you're able, Jesus. In the name of the Lord, for by your stripes we are healed. Touch Sister Myrna today, God. Strengthen her body. Give her healing. Touch Judy today. Lord, I'm standing upon your word, God, as she's in this battle with cancer. Lord, I believe you are greater. We speak help, Lord, to her body in Jesus' name. Lord, we command this body to come in line with the word of God. Oh, Lord, there's healing in the word today. Lord, send healing to Judy Inman right now. In the name of Jesus, those that have gathered here today that need a miracle, Lord, you're able. Oh, in the name of Jesus, I believe you this morning. Lord, I'm trusting you today. Lord, I'm putting my faith in you, Lord. We're asking because we know that you are able. We're asking, Lord, because we know you hear when we pray. Lord, you have your way, Jesus. Jesus. Have your way, Lord Jesus. And we give you the praise for it. Oh, let's thank the Lord for answering prayer today, Lord. I thank you, God. Oh, I 
said in Jesus name amen our ushers are going to come today we're going to give as unto the Lord this is an act of our worship amen and let me also mention that our custom is that we step out toward the outer aisles we come down the middle or across the front and back down the middle amen for those of you that uh, that care to come amen even if you don't have something to give if you want to come Amen. And fellowship, get a little exercise, exercise your faith. Amen. And uh, march around with us and uh, take a few moments to greet one another as, as we celebrate the presence of the Lord in our midst today. Amen. Isn't the Lord good? Amen. Turn to your neighbor and tell them the Lord is among us. Amen. And uh, so we've already made the announcements. Let me mention also right here in the middle is a little skinny usher, and he's holding the bag there. Uh, this is a free will offering for our Christmas at our place. That We used to take donations. We used to bring food stuffs. So we used to bring canned goods. There are many people working, many people cooking, many people in the drama. There's set-up teams. There's clean-up teams. We could not do it without all of your help. So please be aware that there are some that may be already invested in some way but if you're here today and you want to help in, in financially you're welcome to do that right here in the middle uh, before the pulpit the skinny usher ties and offerings uh, please just uh, uh, put those in the buckets with the, the skinny ushers to my right and my left amen somebody say amen and let me also mention when you come around and you give your offering go back to your seat we're going to have a time of worship if you want to be seated you're welcome to if you want to stand you're welcome to if you want to get out of the aisle you're welcome to if you want to whatever you feel like doing somebody say amen lord thank you for this day thank you for this time of worship and we thank you lord for what you've provided for us and lord this that we're about to give is just a thanksgiving offering that says lord you're our provider and we know you're the source of all the things that we have we give you praise lord Help us to give cheerfully today in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. God bless you as you give. Let's worship the Lord today. Give all our praise for an ending mercy, for a 
is the power that lifted us out of the grave. Yours is the heart that is beating inside us. Yours is the glory and all of the fame. And yours is the love that you pour down on us. We're rising up to sing your praise. To the King Almighty, to the one who saves, be glory and honor.
restored heaven, rescued, redeemed, we're alive, we're forgiven, shouting our praise with our hands toward heaven, rescued, redeemed, we're alive, we're forgiven, shouting our praise with our hands toward heaven, rescued, redeemed, we're alive, we're forgiven, shouting our praise with our hands toward heaven, rescued, redeemed, we're alive, we're forgiven.
about what that praise is. It is a sacrifice of praise. Somebody say amen. Amen. I want to tell you when you feel like it, it's good to praise the Lord. I want to tell you when you don't feel like it, it's good to praise the Lord. Amen. In the middle of the sunshine, it's good to praise the Lord. But in your darkest moment, it's time to praise the Lord. I must remind you, I'm going to take my text. I'm going to take my text from his lengthy book. But I must remind you that after five chapters, Isaiah didn't have much. Uh, in fact, the first five chapters, uh, it, it's, it's quite negative reading. Uh, it's, it's, it's judgmental reading. It, is, it, is, uh, it sounds like mad preacher reading. But we begin chapter 6 where he says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord also high and lifted up. <laughs> I want to tell you right now, I don't know what you've been seeing for five chapters of your life either. But I want to tell you, if you could look beyond the impossible things and you could see today that he is still on the throne. He is still high and lifted up. He's still victorious. Amen. He's still a conqueror, and we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Oh, he deserves our praise today. Come on, give him praise this morning. I love you, Jesus. I worship you, Lord. Well, clap your hands under the Lord today. We we'll give you praise, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord draw your attention uh, just so you're aware any of you that are involved in what goes on in the back room you know where where the servants are getting the water together and and uh, somehow between their meager efforts and the point of a miracle something miraculous happens 
The servants know that all they do is what they can do. Amen. But somewhere in the middle of doing all they can do, God meets them and turns water into wine. So those of you that labor in the back room know that uh, I didn't tell the praise team what to sing today. I didn't instruct Sister Tracy what to lead the choir in today. But it's pretty obvious. As you will hear from what I believe the Lord laid on my heart today to preach to you. I want to preach to you something I've titled The Wonder of Jesus. The Wonder of Jesus. Isaiah chapter 9, beginning with verse 6. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. Everybody say forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And we are now on the backside of that prophecy and we see that the zeal of the Lord has performed that and is performing this. Somebody say amen. Like I said, I'm going to title this sermon, The Wonder of Jesus. Let's pray together and let's ask him to have his way. Lord, I thank you for this day. Lord, the privilege we have to be here together with those, Lord, that have come to worship you, Lord. Every person that comes every Sunday, we thank you for it. Lord, those that have gathered here today, maybe for the first time. Lord, we just ask you would give revelation to this congregation that that light would begin to shine, Lord, as it has already shined, Lord, through the, through the worship of your people, Lord. And I pray, God, you would touch each one of us and let us to hear and receive with meekness your engrafted word that it's able to save our souls. And everybody said, in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You can be seated in the name of the Lord. Uh, I was, uh, I was uh, thankful today, I mentioned it, uh, about uh, what we experienced in our Sunday school lesson today, and there was a verse that we, we didn't really focus on, we did mention it, but in, in our lesson today, there was a verse uh, in that passage about G- the inability of Jesus to do certain mighty things in a certain community. And the the way Jesus put it was that the prophet is not without honor save in his own country or his own city or community. And uh, Jesus explained that he he was not only able before and able after to do mighty works of miracles uh, around that city. He, there was a parenthesis, though, in that community that restricted Jesus from doing many mighty works in their midst. And it had to do with their understanding of who Jesus is. A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country. That had to do with who they believed, Jesus, his identity, who he was, who he is. Uh, many of them in another trans, or another gospel uh, stating that is this not the carpenter's son? Didn't we go to synagogue with him? Didn't we go to the classes with him? Didn't we, weren't we raised up in our Jewish faith with him? Didn't we, didn't we see him grow up? Didn't we... Uh, did we see him uh, mature as the rest of us? What makes him more special than all of us? And the Bible states that he could not do many miracles because of who they considered he was. Right. 
Let me just say at the outset today, I, I, I love it when the people of God begin to worship and we begin to experience the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. When his spirit begins to move, amen, he has not left us. We are not alone. We have a comforter here in the present, here in the now. And it is not another. It is the spirit of Jesus Christ in our midst. Amen. I, I would like to go on record and state that I believe that God, uh, that it's possible that there are few things happen spiritually, few things happen miraculously, not because we don't believe God is able and not because we don't believe he has all power and not because we don't believe he knows what he's doing and he's sovereign. But I believe there are some times that God cannot do what he wants to do because of our ideas about Jesus. Somebody say amen. It has to do with our thoughts about who he is. It has to do with our, about our, our concept. And, and I just want to, to uh, come to this pulpit today to raise the awareness in every heart of every listener here today of how wonderful, how mighty, how glorious, how powerful Jesus Christ is. Somebody say amen. Would you clap your hands to the Lord today? Going to this. Come on, clap your hands unto the Lord while we make a little shift here. Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord praise today. Lord, you're worthy. I'm also aware that I'm preaching in a time of a great crisis of faith. I'm preaching to a generation or a time in our culture where foundations are crumbling. And there are many in the church that are worried and fearful and anxious over what we see happening around us. But let me declare to you today that Nebuchadnezzar, a long time ago, uh, way, way back there in the book of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar saw it. Uh, he saw it very plainly. He saw a stone cut out of the mountain, and that stone was cut out without hands, and it came rolling down the mountain and hit a great image in the feet. And before it was over with, that image had fallen. That image had been crushed by that stone. And that stone Nebuchadnezzar saw grow, grew into a huge mountain that eventually filled the entire earth. I want to tell you who that stone is today. <laughs> I want to preach to you about who that stone is today that Nebuchadnezzar, that wicked king of Babylon, saw in his dream. Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 14, the prophet Habakkuk states, For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That day is coming, friend. <laughs> You recognize we have gathered in the four walls of this gymnasium today to worship God. Uh, we might be arrested if we tried to take it outside of these four walls. If we got real excited about it, we might get thrown off of our flight like somebody this past week. Uh, there was a lady acting very erratic. And uh, in fact, the title of the article talked about a possessed woman on an airplane and uh, the, the flight attendants were trying to control her. And when they finally got her semi-control, there was a lady in that airplane that stood up and began to declare the power of the name of Jesus. She began to declare the gospel of Jesus Christ. And of course, that caused another uproar. I want to tell you, there's nothing like the devil and Jesus showing up on a plane ride to cause a bunch of conflict. We walk out of these doors and go preaching down the streets. They might arrest us for disturbing the peace, but we are here in this room today, and we are all like-minded believers, and we're surrounded by people that love the Lord and honor the Lord. But I want to tell you, there's going to come a day when the knowledge of the Lord God and His glory is going to fill this entire community. We may not be seeing it now, but it's going to grow, and it's going to grow. It's going to continue to move. God is going to continue to have His way. I'm preaching today the wonder of Jesus. The light of Jesus Christ and the knowledge of his glory, Habakkuk said, is going to fill eventually the whole earth as the waters cover the sea. Somebody say amen. 
And I believe that is happening. I believe it is happening. I want to see it in a greater measure. How does this victorious covenant fulfilling work of God come about? In Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, he said, For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. How do we have the glory, the knowledge of the glory of the Lord filling the entire earth? It's not going to be man's effort that do it. It's not going to be man's wisdom that does it. It's going to be an act of Almighty God. Just as Jesus' birth was an act of Almighty God, the knowledge of the glory of Jesus Christ is going to fill the whole earth by a, a similar act of the sovereignty of Almighty God. No church is going to get the credit for it. No religious group is going to get the credit for it. No flesh is going to glory in his presence. There will come a day when all of us turn our eyes to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And we're going to behold our Redeemer. I'm lifting up the mighty name of Jesus today. I want to tell you no one of us will be exhausted. Exa will, will be exhausted. But we will not be exalted in his presence. Jesus is the one we are worshiping today. Oh, clap your hands unto the Lord. He will be exalted. Notice Isaiah says a child is born and a son is given. And then he said his name shall be called. That uh, the translation literally is he is one who will call, there was one who will call his name uh, and that, that term name is the highest use uh, in the original Hebrew. It simply means it sums up the character and the, the declares who the person is. It's more than just a frivolous name. It actually represents the character of the one who is named. And his name shall be called Wonderful. Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Oh, I'm preaching to you today the wonder of Jesus. And yes, we are moving in to what the world would call the holiday season. I, I know it's not the, the time that he, of his birth. It's not the season of his birth. I'm aware of that. But I want to take a moment today because of the schedule that's going on. I want to take a moment today to share with you what I believe is revelation that I believe is revelation that we must hold to and believe if we want to see the mighty move of Almighty God. And it is the revelation of who Jesus is. Oh, the wonder of Jesus Christ. I was startled a few months ago when I happened to be watching a, a sermon by a very famous preacher. His, the title of his sermon was The Person and the Work of the Holy Spirit. If I call this man's name, every one of you in this room would know it. This man has more wisdom, probably more degrees, has studied the Bible far more than I have. I don't want to discredit in any way the, the ministry that he had and the ministry that, uh, that he ministered in. And, but in this sermon, he, he stated, and I began to type it because I wanted to get the quote just right. He said, there are three persons in the Holy Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And then he said, you say, I do not understand that. And then he stated, neither do I. And he said, I cannot explain it, at least at this point. Now, compared to his biblical knowledge and his, his experience in ministry, I probably have a thimble full. But I'll tell you what I do have. I do have the word of the Lord. I do have the revelation of his spirit. I, I can go to the word of God and say, well, if I don't understand it, Lord, can you show it to me? Lord, if, I, if nobody can explain it to me, Lord, can you explain it to me? And I am thankful for the word of the Lord today. 
And let me just declare by the word of the Lord today emphatically, first and foremost, that there is only one God. Now, you're not going to hear that in just every religious circle. In fact, uh, there are those that would say, well, because you do not believe the doctrine of the Trinity, you are labeled a cult. Well, I want to tell you, friend, I want to believe the Word of God. I want to stand on His Word and His Word alone. I, uh, and I want to declare to you today that there is only one God. I'm not just going to declare it to you. I'm going to prove it to you, not by creed and not by history. I want to prove it to you by the word of the Lord that endures forever. Oh, the wonder of who Jesus is. It is stated emphatically in the first commandment, Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might, and with all thy... And, and these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Look at that. And then he begins to say, don't just let it die with one generation. Verse 7, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way and when thou liest down and when thou risest up and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. In other words, everywhere you go and everything you do, don't forget, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Thou shalt write them upon the post of thine house and on thy gates. When you're leaving your house and open the little gate to your yard. I want the last thing you see. But oh, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. When you come home from work and you go to the door of your house, I want to see it. I want you to see it written on the post of your house. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. This is the fundamental creed of Judaism. It is the foundation of the Old Testament. The clear emphasis is on the fact that there is one God. He stated that it's to be taught at every opportunity in every way. In fact, the scribe came to Jesus in Mark chapter 12, specifically verse 28, and asked Jesus what is the greatest commandment. You know what Jesus stated. He repeated this very scripture as the first and greatest commandment. There is one indivisible God. There is one God known in the Old Testament as Jehovah or Yahweh. He is the supreme God. He is God alone. And that name is the name by which he revealed himself to Israel. Somebody say amen. amen. I know this also that the Old Testament, the book of Hebrews tells us, was a schoolmaster that should bring us to Christ. In other words, everything in the OT... Everything in the Old Testament, we should see Jesus in it. For an example, if you're studying calculus, we might, uh, you got to be sure that your math is correct. Uh, so you start with the basics. You don't get a five-year-old in the learning center and start them with calculus. You start them with two apples. But two apples leads to calculus and algebra. How many apples do we have here, Johnny? You start with the simple and move to the complicated. The New Testament doctrine is first and foremost the clearest exposition of our salvation. It is a full revelation of truth. But to get us there in terms of concepts, uh, we must have God defined for us. So God defined himself in simple terms. He did it in the Old Testament. And he said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. When we read the New Testament, we cannot read it from a fourth century philosophy and say, well, here's our church creeds that we, we uh, drag back from history in the fourth century. When we read the Old Testament to understand who God is, we move to the New Testament and recognize the full revelation of who he is. And God said, I'm just one. I'm one person in mind, will, body, spirit, and soul. Somebody said, 
say amen. I am, I am one person in body, soul, and spirit. I relate many different ways to other people. To my wife, I'm a husband. To my mother, I'm a son. To my children, I'm a father. To the church I pastor, I'm a pastor. I have different titles, but they all point back to the same being. There is one God. I'm going to continue here. And you may like it or you may not like it, but I pray for, uh, for God to help me to have the right attitude because I do not want to be vengeful. I don't want to be arrogant. I don't want to come across as some smart aleck in any way. But I want to tell you, I thanked the Lord again this week of the wonder of who Jesus is. And there are folks that believe a Trinitarian doctrine that believe there are three co-equal, co-eternal gods. That there is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. And they will call him persons. They will say God is in three persons. And I guess with terminology, uh, they, they, they say, well, we believe he's uh, three persons in one God. So there's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And these three persons together make one God. Whereas as a oneness believer believes that God is one and that God manifests himself in different ways in all eternity and time. <laughs> Somebody say amen. So let me continue. Not only is there one God, but I want to declare to you there is only one God and he is God alone. <laughs> When, when we read in Genesis where it says, let us make man, I do not believe God the creator was speaking to Jesus the son who was already in existence. That is not in your Bible. In fact, my Bible declares that God is God by himself, singularly. Isaiah 44 in verse 8 Fear ye not neither fear ye not neither be afraid have not I told thee from that time and have declared it you even you are even my witnesses is there a god beside me Yea, there is no God. I know not any. Isaiah 46 and 5, to whom will you liken me and make my equal and compare me to that we may be alike? So when Philip says, Lord, show us the Father, it is not correct to say, well, Jesus just looked like the Father because in Isaiah 46, he declares, I am not like anybody else. Are you, is anybody hearing what I'm saying today? Oh, the wonder of who Jesus is. Isaiah 46 in verse 9. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. If you find somebody who is exactly like God in every way, I want to tell you now, you have found God. No, no, you didn't find another God the prophet Isaiah said that Yahweh, there is none like him. There is no other God beside him. So if you find somebody that's just like God, you have found God. There is no one like God and yet a different being person other than God. Isaiah 45, verse 5 and 6, you can read it for yourself. I hope that's authenticated enough for you being on the screen. I am the Lord and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is none else he is God alone but not only is he God alone but that God who is one all by himself the Bible tells us is the God that created all things Isaiah 36 verse 16 O Lord of hosts God of Israel that dwelleth between the cherubims thou art the God even thou alone of all the kingdoms of the earth thou hast made heaven and earth 
Nehemiah 9 and 6, Thou, even thou, art Lord alone. Thou hast made heaven and the heaven of heavens with all their host, the earth and all things that are therein, the seas and all that is therein, and thou preservest them all, and the host of heaven worshipeth thee. Somebody say amen. I want to declare to you today that not only is he one and not only was he God all by himself, there was no one beside him and he is the God that created heaven and earth. I want to tell you he is also, that one God is also our redeemer and our savior. Oh, the wonder of Jesus. Isaiah 43, verse 10, you are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servants whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. Are you hearing what I'm saying? No, are you hearing what the word is saying? I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Now, did you hear me? In Isaiah, Yahweh said, there is no other God before me nor after me. And if you're going to get saved, Yahweh is going to save you. Come on, let's lift up the name of Jesus right now for a minute. Come on, let's praise the Lord right now. Let's praise him. I hope this is not boring you because I believe the miraculous comes when we believe and know who Jesus is. I believe the Lord wants to do mighty works among us. Let it not be said that the prophet was without honor in his own house. I want to know who he is. I want to celebrate who he is. I want to honor who he is today. Oh, I'm here to preach to you of the wonder of Jesus. Isaiah 44 and verse 6, thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Beside me there is no God. Isaiah 44, 24, thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb, I am the Lord that maketh all things and stretcheth forth the heavens alone. We find emphatically the Word of God declaring in the Old Testament before we have the physical revelation in the flesh of Jesus Christ. We find where the prophet Isaiah said, it is the Lord that makes all things. He stretched forth the heavens and he did it by himself. But it is that God that is our Redeemer. Somebody say amen. I want to tell you why God alone saves. No man can save. I can't save. The person beside you can't save you. Only God can save you. And the one God who created the whole earth, and not only is our Savior, but he is our Savior because only God can forgive sins. That is a miraculous act. Forgiveness is a miraculous act. It states only God can do it. And there are doctors that can, that have and can uh, cure cancer, so to speak. Whatever medicine they use or whatever therapies they use, there are people that have come out of the disease of cancer or sugar diabetes or other things. There are things that are possible with men. But I want to tell you what's impossible with men is to forgive sins. Only God can forgive sins. What a mighty God we serve. Oh, the wonder of Jesus. Isaiah 43, verse 25. I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for my own sake and will not remember thy sins. Oh, the wonder of who he is. In fact, when Jesus performed a number of miracles, it was stated that he was overheard telling the recipient of the miracle that they had been forgiven of their sins. 
The Bible tells us that the Pharisees who were very schooled in the apples of mathematics, who were very schooled in the simplicity of hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. They could not see who Jesus is, and they could not understand how he could forgive sins because they recognized that there was only one forgiver, and that was Almighty God, Jehovah. Oh, the wonder of Jesus. I want to tell you today, John chapter 8 and verse 24 states emphatically who Jesus states himself of his own identity. If you don't believe me, believe Jesus. And you probably ought to believe him anyway. John 8 verse 24 I said therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. Now I just put the one verse up there. Stay with me. But this is in response to a question earlier in that same chapter where the Jews asked Jesus specifically, where is your father? No, no, listen to me. The Jews ask him, where is your father? Now, there is no lying in Jesus. There is no variableness nor shadow of turning. He is the truth. He never told one lie. So when the Jews says, where is your father? It would have been easy for him if he was the second person sent by the father to this earth. It would have been easy for Jesus to say, my father is there. There, 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 where, doesn't matter, there. But he did not do that. He stated emphatically to those that said, where is your father? He said, I have told you that except you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. I want to tell you today, I'm thankful for who Jesus is. Oh, the wonder of the mighty name of Jesus. I want all of you to be well aware that there may be churches everywhere that say we are Jesus people, but there ain't nobody more Jesus people than the people in this room right here. Come on, clap your hands unto the Lord. In fact, let me, let me put the verse up there like it is in the original. In the original Greek, in fact, in your KJV, if you read John 8, 24, you will notice the he in the verse is in italicized print. That simply is a signal that that word is not in the original verse. In other words, if we took the verse in the original writing of John 8, 24, it would look like this. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am, you shall die in your sins. I want to tell you I'm lifting up the wonder of who Jesus is today. He is more than just a man. He is more than just a redeemer. Redeemer. He is the creator of the universe, wrapped in flesh, come to be with us, and has not left us comfortless. Remember, Jesus is speaking to Jewish believers. It's emphatic in John 8 that the Jews ask him, where is your father? So Jesus, knowing his audience states emphatically to those Jews who they ought to believe he was. For in Exodus chapter 3 verse 13, Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you. And they will say to me, here we go. This has been a question since Exodus. What is his name? The God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has sent me to you, and they are going to ask me, what is his name? 
what shall I say unto them? And God said to Moses, I am that I am. And he said, this is what you are to say to the children of Israel. This is what you are to say to those Jewish believers. I am hath sent me unto you. So when those Jews said, show us where your father is, Jesus goes back to Exodus 3 and says, I am, I am. I want to tell you who Jesus is. He is God wrapped in flesh. Come on, somebody magnify the name of Jesus today. Oh, the wonder of Jesus. Jesus is the great I am. By his own admission, Jesus is the great I am. He's the God that sent Moses to deliver Israel out of Egypt's snare. Jesus said, I am. And except you believe that I am, you shall perish. I'm here to worship him, magnify him, adore him, exalt him, Jesus. What a privilege to even know his name, Jesus. What an honor to baptize believers in the saving name of Jesus. Oh, I don't want to ever take for granted when Jesus moves among us that I don't give him honor. Isaiah 45, verse 21, tell, me, tell ye and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together who had declared this from ancient time, who had told it from that time. Have not I the Lord... And there is no God else beside me, a just God and a Savior. There is none beside me. Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is none else. I have sworn by myself the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return. That unto me every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear. May I take you to Philippians chapter 2, verse 9. Paul, writing to the church at Philippi, says, Wherefore God hath highly exalted him, and that him in that verse is Jesus, and given him a name, and that name is Jesus, which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, <laughs> of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let me tell you, we're not going to bow to the Father and then we're not going to bow to Jesus. When we bow to Jesus, we are bowing to the Father wrapped in a body. Gee, God stated it in Isaiah. To me, every knee will bow, and to me, every tongue will confess. And Paul said, I want to tell you who we're going to bow to. That name is Jesus. That person is Jesus. Oh, the wonder of Jesus. Jesus is the fulfillment. The term father is a term of relationship. Before my children were born, I was not a father. I did not change my nature or my personality. I did not split into two persons when I became a father. Deuteronomy 32 states God is the father of the nation of Israel. Malachi 2 states he's God, that God is the father of all creation. God's also spoken of as the father of every born again believer. God is the father of the baby Jesus because Joseph didn't have anything to do with the conception. He who causes conception is by definition the father. The spirit of God supernaturally caused a virgin to conceive. So God is literally the father of the baby Jesus. Jesus Christ. 
Luke 1 35 tells us why Jesus is the Son of God. Look at it. Luke 1 35. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore, or for this reason also, that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And what those angels said on that night is neither legend nor expensive decorations. It is a fact. It cannot be revised by this culture who wants to revise everything. But let me show you what cannot be altered. Luke chapter 2, verse 11. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. Isaiah has already declared over and over that Jehovah, Yahweh, is the only Savior. The angels declared it in Luke chapter 2. Born this day in the city of David is a Savior, and he is Christ the Lord. Jesus is the revelation of that one true God. Jehovah says, I'm the only Savior. Jesus is the fulfillment of that. Jehovah says, if you want to be saved, you must look to me. Jesus is the fulfillment of that. How can we say that Jesus is our Savior? Only if we recognize that Jesus is Jehovah from the Old Testament, manifest in the body to us believers here today. There is no other Savior. Jesus. This world is making us realize that they do not care what God we worship as long as our God doesn't have an identity. But I'm here to declare to you the name of Jesus. We worship Jesus. We honor Jesus. We're going to lift up Jesus. We're going to baptize in his name. We're going to eat our supper in his name. We're going to come to church in his name. Everything we do, we're going to do for the glory and the honor of his name. Acts chapter 4 and verse 10, be it known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I've all read this verse, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which is become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Peter is saying there is no other stone. There is no other person. Jehovah said he was the only redeemer. Why is there no other person? Because there is no other name. Peter said it. There is no other name. God only gave that name, Savior, to one person, and that name is Jesus. And isn't it amazing for all you Bible scholars that the name Jesus really means Jehovah has become my salvation. Oh, let me tell you who Jesus is. He is our Savior. He is God manifest in the flesh. That's who he is. Well, bear with me a minute. 1 Timothy 3, 16. Without controversy. <laughs> Amen. How many would say, you're right. Paul says to Timothy, without controversy, Great is the mystery of godliness. We're not arguing about it. There's a lot of folks mystified by the Godhead. And, and I, I hail the name, but I'm going to share it now. The man who preached this doctrine all over the world and stated him by his own admission, you say, I don't understand the Trinity? He said, I don't understand it either. It was Billy Graham. Billy Graham. I'm not done what he's done. I've probably not studied many as hours as he studied. But Paul said to Timothy, there's no controversy over the mystery of godliness. It can fool you if you're not careful. 
But Paul said to Timothy, I want to tell you about godliness. I want to tell you about the Godhead. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed unto the, believed on in the world, and received up in the glory. I want to tell you who Jesus is. Paul said to the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians 5, 19, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. I speak Jesus. Colossians 2, verse 9, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power well that's fine and dandy preacher I I realize now what you're saying after all this time you could have just told me you're not a Trinitarian preacher you could have told me you're a oneness believer that God was manifest in the flesh anybody here today so what does this have to do with me Is it just a theological sermon where we say, well, you know, the Bible seems to say that. I guess it's just the way you interpret it. How does it affect me? Hebrews 2, 16. He's talking about our God, our creator. When he states, for verily, he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. That tells me that God came as the seed of Abraham. He came as a man. What does that have to do with me, preacher? Well, I must remind you that both men and angels had lost their way. Before Adam sinned, there were one-third of the angels that were thrown out of God's presence. God created Adam and Eve, ate of the fruit. They also were fallen. And I want to tell you now, God made a choice. He chose to redeem you and me. Think about it now. Angels move in heaven. Angels move in the spirit realm. If the Bible tells us they're always among us and we don't even see them. We entertain them unaware. My place is in the earthly. What I can see, what I can experience, what I can hear in the dust, in the fleas and the flies and the moths and the spiders and the worms. Yep, that's us. I ask you this question. Who among us were we given a choice would take the worse and leave the better. That's what Almighty God did for you and me. He did not take on the seed of angels. He was in, he in no wise, the scripture says. In other words, he didn't even give it a second thought. He did not give, take in the angel's nature a second thought, but he took on the seed of Abraham. Why did he do it? He granted unto me something that he denied the angels. I know this, the angels can sin and they did sin and they have sinned and when they were thrown out did God go looking for any one of them? Did God go searching for any of them? Did God go seeking any of them? God did not. He let them go. They had no promises. They had no gospel. They had no evangelist, no missionary. Nobody was ever sent to them. But when Adam fell, God made mobilized all of heaven to go after that one sinner oh what a wonder you are thank you Lord thank you Lord when man fell God
God said, oh, no, I'm not giving up on him. In fact, he came the same day of his fall, and he said, Adam, where are you? I'm looking for you. Knowing what he had done, God was already looking for him. I want to tell you now, the fact is that Jesus came looking for you also. He didn't want you lost. He didn't want you going to a devil's hell. He wants you to be in eternity with him. He's not willing that any perish. Somebody say amen. The wonder of Jesus. I want you to think about this for a moment. The magnitude. The magnitude of the creator of the universe. The glory of the thought of the creator of all we see and know that God coming for you it's almost too much for words <laughs> to think that he would come for me in the form of the seed of a woman he would wrap himself in flesh no I'm sorry I do not believe that the creator of this universe loved me so much that he sent somebody else no I believe the glory and the wonder of Jesus that Almighty God wrapped everything he was and is in the man Jesus Christ and when he didn't go looking for the angels guess what he did he said, I'm going to have to have a body to find those people. And he wrapped himself in flesh. And he came to save you and to save me. Jehovah has become my salvation. <laughs> what a mighty God. Yes, it's the most wonderful gospel most wonderful name in fact I know I haven't done it justice today I ask God to help me with it but I want to say to you it's beyond my imagination how almighty God can love you so much that he would come and give his own flesh and blood that he created that he would suffer death and the grave for each one of us. Anybody hearing what I'm saying? Jesus told it this way in the story of the lost sheep. He searched through the night until he found him, laid it on his shoulders and brought him home again. He came himself after you and after me. It means that God said, <laughs> that man's gonna need salvation and I'm the only one that can save him. And Genesis chapter 2, verse 27, I believe it is, tells me that God gave man dominion in the earth. And so the Savior God was a long way from man who had dominion in the earth. And God said, I'm going to have to go save them. I'm going to get me a body. I will go myself. I'm going to find him myself. I want to tell you, Jesus is wonderful. And before his 34th birthday, he found you and he found me. Now I have, I have a right to lift my hands today. I have a right to sing the songs of Zion today because Jesus has found us. For this, we are thankful. I want you to stand right now and I want you to ask God to put on your heart how wonderful, how magnificent, how glorious it is to know Jesus Christ. I want you right now to say, Lord, I want you to let it somehow fall in my heart, the magnitude of who you are, the glory of who you are, the magnitude of your identity. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I thank you, Jesus. 
Come on, reach over right now. Rich, just join together. Come on, on this Sunday morning, I just want you to, to get together. Hold on to your, the hand of your spouse or your family beside you. Or maybe it's a friend. I want you to pray, God, don't ever let us lose the wonder of Jesus. His glory, the knowledge of his glory is going to fill the whole earth. One of these days, they're going to see him again. <laughs> Come on, he's coming back. <laughs> yes, he is. His name is Jesus. His vesture's dipped in blood. He's got a, he's got a name across his chest, King of kings and Lord of lords. <laughs> Come on, somebody lift up Jesus right now. Come on, as you begin to thank him for salvation, when you understand the magnitude of what he did for you, it will cause you to seek him with your whole heart. Come on, right now, Lord. I just want to say thank you for what you've done for me. You didn't have to do it. You could have let us go just like you let the angels go. But here we stand today, saved, redeemed by the blood. Come on. Come on, young people, don't be ashamed of Jesus. Come on, saints of God, don't be ashamed of Jesus. Come on, testify everywhere you go of who Jesus is. He is the mighty God in Christ. He is Jehovah that has become my salvation. Oh, come on, lift up your praise unto the Lord. Jesus, I thank you, Lord. Come on, I, I, mean, I mean it, folks. Come on, I, I know there's some apostolics in here that you say, well, I've heard that all my life. I would to God you'd have never heard it, and this would be the first Sunday you ever heard it. I would you would say, Lord, help me to realize afresh and anew how powerful it is to know who you are. <laughs> how wonderful it is, oh Jesus, to know who you are. lift you up. We magnify you, Lord. We call on your name, Lord. Oh, come on, lift your hands unto the Lord and lift your voices. We're going to sing and pray in a minute, but let's, let's, not, let's, let's not move quickly from this place. Come on. Lord, have your way. I want you to do it again. There are men and women in this room right now that need revelation in their hearts. The Word of God has been preached. I want you to pray one more time, Lord. Reach over, connect. Come on. We, something happens when believers begin to share what they believe. You say, well, I, I shouldn't lay hands on anybody. Come on. If you're a believer, you have a right to share what you believe right now. Put your hand on somebody right now. Let revelation come to that man. us, Lord. Oh, come on, let's just seek after him right now, Lord. Show us the wonder of your glory. Show us the wonder of your glory. I 
I, I can read a bunch of them. I, I can go to Revelation 4 where John sees a glimpse of the throne room and he, he sees all those four and twenty elders around the throne and he begins to describe he said there's one throne and there's one that sits on the throne he begins to describe him and then he says he, he defines him for us he tells us who's on that throne he says it's the lamb that's on that throne that's Jesus high and lifted up at the right hand, absolutely, the most exalted being, Jesus. I must remind you, Revelation, I just want to read this one. Revelation 1, verse 9. I, John, who, am also, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos on, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. And I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and her... Oh, I would to God that we could get in the spirit on the Lord's day. Something would happen. He said, I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What thou seest, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, in Ephesus, Smyrna, and Pergamos, Thyatira, and Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice. I turned to see the voice. Is anybody hearing me? I want to tell you, John found out that the voice has a face, that the word has a face. Being turned to see the voice, I was looking for a voice. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, I saw one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot. Who is the Son of Man? That's Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ had just said, I'm Alpha and Omega, I'm first and the last. And on his head, and his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like undefined brass, as if it burned in a furnace, and his voice was as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in his strength. And when I saw him, look, look. When John, the apostle John, when he saw him in all of his glory, he fell at his feet as dead. If we could just get a glimpse of who he is. I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand on me and said, fear not. I am the first and the last. You want to know who he is? Take his words for it. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. I want to tell you that's my Jesus. And I've come to exalt him today and to lift him up. Come on right now all over this building. Let's magnify the name of Jesus as we sing together. As we worship together, I believe God wants to do a mighty work. Come on, if you need Jesus this morning, you want to repent of your sins, I'm opening the altar right now. You want to come and say, thank you, Lord, for coming and finding me. I want to open this altar right now. If you want to come and say, thank you, Lord, for the revelation that Jehovah is my Savior, I just want to say thank you, Lord. Come on, the altar's open for whosoever will, will let him come. Come on right now. Come on right now, Jesus. All our hope is in Jesus. All our hope is in Jesus.
say praise the Lord aren't you glad for what Jesus has done for you aren't you thankful for how far he came for you somebody say amen amen God bless you for being in the house of the Lord today amen I'm going to turn this service to you I've had it long enough if you want to stay and pray you want to walk around and thank Jesus for coming after you if you want to 
thank God for the revelation that you have today. You do what you feel like doing. Amen. Somebody say amen. Amen. God richly bless you. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you're going to leave, greet somebody and tell them you're glad to see them in the house of the Lord. Share the love of the Lord with somebody as you leave today. In Jesus' name.